much. My name is Catherine Boyer. I'll kind of do my own introduction a little bit more deeply about myself. When I do these artist talks, you inevitably get to know a lot about my family, um, as well as my own kind of upbringing. So you'll know a lot about me by the end of this. Um, and also my family, which are presented here. So my name is Catherine Boyer. I am uh, originally from, I was born in Regina, Saskatchewan. And uh, I moved to Winnipeg here on uh, Treaty 1 territory to get my master's degree. And uh, I did so at the U of M and haven't left. And I'm perfectly happy to call this my new home. So my, my family is from around this region, historically. Um, the Red River, uh, Saint Boniface, Saint Francois Xavier, um, and a few other communities that were predominantly Métis at the, uh, during the fur trade and before. So, um, one of the reasons that I wanted to come here to work is that my practice inevitably draws a lot of um, intimate experiences by being on site, being at the place that these uh, historical events have happened in. So um, when I talk about my family, I, I'm thinking about them actually kind of walking in the same places that I get, of, get to walk now. Um, which to me is, is just um, gives me deep satisfaction. So um, that's sort of one of the main reasons that I, I love being in this area. It uh, means a lot to me. So um, without further ado, let me introduce you to the other Boyers. Um, so this is the, the Boyer family. Um, I love starting off with this photo because I think it's just a, it is as quintessential a family photo as you can get. Um, I'm sure if we looked at any of our families uh, and photographic history, there's probably a similar type of, of image in, in your own archives. So uh, I love this uh, because it really centers the two individuals that were pivotal to the um, movement of my family up to Canada. We originally uh, lived in the North Dakota Turtle Mountain area and then came up here which I'll talk a lot more about because it's very relevant and specific to the exhibition downstairs. But I'll just point out the people in the center of the image is uh, Mary and Louis Boyer. Mary LaRock is uh, an individual I do a lot of work about. Uh, she's my great grandmother and uh, has a, uh, an incredible art career of her own um, that I take a lot of inspiration from. Uh, so this is her in her later years. Um, she lived to be 101 years old, so she had an incredibly prolific life, and on the uh, centennial year of her life, the family decided that it was uh, important to chronicle her journey and her family and all of her children with a book. Uh, so they put together this book, it's got first-hand stories um, by her, about her family, about her upbringing, and uh, also about this man named Duncan McDoodle. McDougal, sorry. <laughs> Ooh. Um, so this was her father. Um, he had uh, scrip and land off of the Red River, just north of Winnipeg proper. Um, and so she, she was originally born in uh, a border town. They kind of moved around. Um, a bit more freely than we would kind of imagine moving around now. Um, they had multiple houses in, in different areas and that included across the border. So um, movements across borders is something that I kind of look to eventually working with a little bit more extensively because my family had a, a fluidity that is obviously no longer doable. Um, but I think that um, the idea of, of borders is is relevant to a lot of different topics, kind of conceptually. So um, all the same, uh, they lived uh, north of the 49th parallel and south in their, in their lifetime. But, um, so when they came uh, finally up from uh, North Dakota, they did this incredible um, months long trek to get up here. And where they decided, where they planned to go was this little burgeoning Métis community in the Cirrus Valley which is uh, just outside of Estevan, Saskatchewan. So it's another sort of, it's quite close to the border, so it was um, within proximity. Um, and they made a little life for themselves. And so one of its features that um, 
any group of people looks for when they're moving from one place to the next is, is water. Uh, and that's something that they, they definitely found here. So this is the Cirrus Valley. Uh, as it was prior to um, 1988. Um, I actually don't know what year this image was taken, but um, you can see this is their farm um, that they had set up. Uh, working off of the river is a historically important act to do. That river was a source of sustenance. It was a source of um, life and food and um, uh, nourishment in all many cases. And, and that would kind of um, be the same no matter what river body you're looking at. Um, if people are living off of it, they're deeming it important. Um, so, so this is the Cirrus Valley. So they settled here um, up, and this is in Canada. This is another view of it. And this is the Boyers again, a little bit younger looking. Though Louis looks the same in every single picture. I don't know how he does it, but maybe he's a vampire. I don't know. Um, so yeah, so this is them. And this is a picture that's actually in the valley. So you can kind of see behind them. Um, they were staged. Who knows where they were going? Probably to church. Um, it was a really important part of, of their life at the time. Uh, Mary attended uh, a boarding school, what is called a boarding school in the States, which is a residential school um, at Devil's Lake. and. She came out of the experience um, being a, a devout Catholic the rest of her life and, and passed that along to, to her family and, and kids. And it's only my dad's generation uh, that he decided to really break that um, pattern. He raised me with zero religion, zero spirituality, nothing was in the household. So, um, that, in his kind of view of it, was in contrast to his own very negative experiences within the church. And, uh, but what I was still trying to wrap my head around was, um, you know, despite all of these, uh, and what I kind of from an outside perspective see as a very negative experience, she still, Mary, still was as in love with the church as anyone could be. So I couldn't reconcile with what that meant or what that, how it applied to me in any way, not that it necessarily should, but here's another adorable view of family life in the valley. Anyways, I'll, I'll kind of get to that a little bit later, but um, this video is uh, downstairs with the, uh, with the work, here we go. Um, so I, after 1988, the government of Saskatchewan decided to flood the Cirrus Valley. Um, at that time, everybody had to leave, um, though the circumstances of how, what that exchange looked like is still very, very hard to find and understand. Leading up to this project, I uh, did as much research as I could um, realistically do. And uh, didn't come up with a lot at the end of it. So um, the valley was flooded. Everyone was displaced that still lived there, my family included. And I saw this as a, a continuance of a pattern where Métis communities are getting displaced at the expense of whomever else. Um, so in this case, the area of Estevan needed consistent water. There was, uh, this valley was prone to flooding, and a dam would... In, um, conceivably uh, rectify that. The project itself was apparently very, very controversial, though again, I don't totally know all the um, ins and outs of it, but the dam is called the Rafferty Almeida Dam. And uh, so the, what I wanted to experience so, so desperately was to visit the site that they were living on and making a livelihood from that was now emerged under this body of water. And so my best thinking was that, well, the closest I can get is to swim around over, over top of it. And, and while that seems like a, a frivolous, maybe, um, uh, I don't know, like quick idea, it was, it was nevertheless very uh, almost like creepy and um, to just kind of think about what is directly below me. So I canoed out to where the site 
was. And you saw that I have those aerial photos. So I was able to kind of um, roughly estimate where it was located. On the other side of the gallery is, is this other channel. Um, and this is the dam itself. And when I went out there, what I actually saw was the swallows had kind of taken back this, this structure that was so controversial and so negative in my mental opinion. They had made their own home out of it. So these barn swallows have kind of taken back um, part of the site for, for themselves. So um, I found that to be really sort of beautifully poetic and uh, really comforting at the end of the day. So this is me as a, a tiny little girl in the front here. This is my dad um, in the back. This photo was taken at the event of our family erecting a cairn at this site. So this is the Cirrus Valley again. You can see that um, the road that would have ran would have come up directly on the other side. So it's this, like, it's this stark image that I've had my whole life. I think I'm probably about seven years old, not that, um, not that old yet. But this was the very first time that my dad had brought me out to the site. And the video that I showed you before is the second time that I went out there. So there was this like, uh, constant in my life of, of feeling like this place held a lot of meaning for me and a lot of meaning for my family. And of course, my dad is there um, recollecting all the fond times they had out at the farm and my aunt. And, and they, they just remember it in, in such vivid detail, like you would as a, in, in childhood, those um, deeply comforting memories. So um, that video, one of the kind of important moments uh, of it is when I am kind of launched out into the water. There's this, this moment of, of freedom, of purpose, of intention. Um, and the same is present in this performance that I did. So I'm kind of jumping around in time. Um, but this is a performance I did at the end of my, of my master's. And uh, it is topical to um, a range of things, but to kind of keep it as short as possible. Uh, the, the fabric chain that you see is, ended up being a performance piece. This chain has five, a set of five tags that are sewn together. So this set of five are units of measure that um, surveyors were using along chains. So if you have ever heard of um, river lots being referred to in like 20 chains or like five chains wide or, or something like that. It was literally originally was a chain that was used as a measuring device. So along that chain itself were these five tags. So what I had done was um, laser cut these tags uh, out of boot liner um, and, and sewn them all together. Because what I was trying to explore was um, the opposite of the kind of expansive separation that uh, I felt occurs when you begin to divide and parcel up land. So rather than that distance that I was sensing, you know, where families kind of move out and spread and, and change location, it was the closeness of like relationships and um, I had a lot of help in sewing these pieces together. Uh, so the closest of my own community that was willing to come and help me in the final hour. Um, so the, the chain of fa now fabric tags ran from the river's edge and uh, ran all the way into the gallery at the U of M. And so what I did is I kind of walked along it. I followed the path and I was wrapping the chain around myself. So it became uh, a burden and also just the kind of bare bones this is how you, the best way to carry something. Um, along the way, I was sewing back together pieces that had fallen apart um, or wringing out uh, water that had, um, uh, that it, the pieces had been sitting in. It was a super rainy day, um, so I'm wearing my rubber boots and I made some quick pants. <laughs> um, but, uh, so this performance happened, uh, yeah, I guess um, almost a full year ago today. Uh, and the resulting exhibition was uh, part of this body of work. Um, so you can see, so what I ended up doing was with that entire pile, I brought it into the gallery space and I, I left it behind. 
Um, so it had the trace of the performance as well as um, all the kind of time and labor that went into um, sewing all of those pieces together. But what I really want to point out to you is this structure. Um, so this is a piece called La Petit Pointe de Sapin. And um, if you remember back, uh, the Duncan McDougall fellow that I showed you earlier, um, he wa uh, eventually had a house in um, uh, Lorette, the Lorette area. Uh, and he and his community at the time would have erected this, the house that they lived in, uh, together as a, um, a kind of a collaborative effort. So the, the house is called the McDougall House. It's actually outside of, it's in the St. Norbert um, Farmer's Market. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, one of those beautiful examples of the dovetail joint, which is a, a woodworking joint that has kind of this perfect like tensile strength. So it can't be pulled apart um, just because of the angles and how they're interlocked. So I saw this as a, a an incredible metaphor for community strength at its finest. It takes um, you know, a group of people to put these houses together. You had one person who was very good with axing and things, uh, and then other people to lift and carry and, and help harvest. And um, so it was really a group effort. Uh, so this work was, uh, again, back in the, completed back in the spring. Um, and Woodworking is uh, an important element in my work, partly because my dad is a carpenter. Uh, so I grew up in the house that he built with his own two hands. I slept on a bed that he had also built with his own two hands. Um, and that world of, of possibility and um, physical capability is something that he taught me very early on. So I have taken that and kind of uh, put my own spin on it, but we have collaborated in a few different ways throughout, um, throughout this uh, body of work and hopefully into the future. Um, because the other thing is that he is he's now nearing the age where he's getting a little bit slower, a little bit more um, forgetful. So it's one of these uh, kind of just personal life uh, endeavors to try and uh, encapsulate um, all of his knowledge and all of his experience, the 50 years plus of, of carpentry that he's uh, done, and to um, show him that it has come to me as well. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to need a little bit of water. <laughs> he was uh, actually here just this last Tuesday. And we did a, a bang making workshop, which is kind of like Métis fry bread. Uh, and I think he had a blast doing it. He was, we had these matching aprons and we did it kind of like a little cooking show thing. So it was a lot of fun. Um, and he's way better at making them than I am. <laughs> so there's also that. I'm just gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, this is uh, another kind of quintessential family photograph around the kitchen table. Uh, and after the, my master's work, I was exploring kind of specific spaces within houses. I was really interested in how the home space could be married with nature in a more, um, that was more relevant and topical to an indigenous experience of home and land. Um, like I think, I think of the two as so, um, so tightly intermixed that to separate them is not what you would do. Um, so I was interested in, in exploring the home space and, and like I had said, finding ways to articulate the importance of, of land and nature within those spaces. So uh, I had kind of, where I had kind of started moving after my graduate work was uh, into the kitchen. I had made a series of beaded tea towels that was um, in honor of um, five women in my family. And uh, so that had kind of started off a, a new trajectory of the kitchen space, which is where recipes like bangs live and um, small teachings of, you know, use what you have, um, make do with what you can. And these are all 
values that come out of a different time, really, of um, where my family was much more um, uh, strapped for food and money. Uh, but all the same, there are nevertheless important lessons that uh, we should all um, keep and, and, and work with and think as relevant in some other context, maybe. So this is just a darling uh, photo of the boyers and a few strangers that I don't recognize around the kitchen table. And so this is the result of um, a few of those lines of thinking. So, uh, so this is my river kitchen table. Uh, so what I had done is that segment of river that Duncan McDougall had land um, a river lot off of, I took that and um, shaped a table out of it. <laughs> when you kind of start coming up with these ideas and you first start articulating them to people, sometimes it like it doesn't always make sense. But if you have a vision in your mind of how, what it's going to look like, um, anyway. So this, this so this uh, is that segment of river, um, and uh, in it are represented four different woods. I was I was thinking of wood in this sense. Uh, as much of a, a body as kind of literally our bodies. Um, I was using water to bend, actually bend and shape the wood. So in a kind of similar way that the body of water in the video was impacting me and, and shaping me and changing me, I was doing similar things with the actual, with the actual wood. And in a lot of ways, of course, like the wood is the kind of core of a tree, so it, it is its body. Um, but the, the four woods are cedar, spruce, fir, and oak. Uh, oak for my dad, because he would make everything out of oak if he could. <laughs> so the table legs are made out of oak, because I don't have a budget that would make a whole table out of oak. Um, but uh, what I was kind of interested in is, is reflecting on the mixed uh, cultural identities that are represented in my own family. So I was thinking of these different types of woods, and um, their different colorings and their different shades as, as being uh, for those different um, cultural groups that, that I kind of wholly represent. So uh, rather than have a, wood, a table out of all one wood, which doesn't totally, I mean, maybe it makes logical sense in the real world, uh, not in the art world. Um, and these are Red River tiles. So I've actually gotten to harvest the, the clay from the Red River. And the result are kitchen tiles that are the same types of tiles that are in my uh, home that my dad built, that I grew up in, that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so part of the installation are these, are these two enamel pots. And if, you're, if you get a chance to be in this space alone, um, I would take a second just to stop somewhere in between and, and listen, because what you can hear, if you're very quiet, is uh, a heartbeat that starts on one side. Water will come in, and it moves the sound of the heartbeat to the other side, the other pot. So my thinking is that at the space of a kitchen table, when we're, when we're sitting opposite the people that we love and that we um, want to learn from, there's an exchange that happens. And so uh, that's one of the ways that I represented that exchange. So one of the heartbeats is mine, and the other heartbeat is my auntie's, who has taught me a lot and continues to. So this piece is, is really a bit of an ode to her uh, in a lot of ways. OK, so back to Mary for a little bit. Um, and she's sweet, sweet little face. So Mary, um, uh, she did one of those um, types of art making that, that women during that time were almost bound to do. But uh, so she, before I got to get too far down that road, she did rug hooking. Um, rug hooking and rug braiding and um, uh, to me, that art form represents all the best ways of being resourceful and of care and of love and devotion to your family. It meant that you were collecting fabric for months, days, years, who, however long it took, um, things that were too worn out to mend any further, um, or that 
all your kids had grown out of and you no know, one to pass it down to, or whatever it was. Um, it meant that she was hanging on to these articles for, for her ultimate creative vision. So we still have a few of these rugs in our family. Um, this is a braided one. And then this is another one of my favorites. Um, and I'm showing you these two specifically because they're topical to the show downstairs um, and some of the work in there. But um, this one specifically, what she would do is she would send her daughters out to go draw her flowers and she would take those drawings and, and make them into rugs. And that is sort of, that was her process. Um, and it's a process that is mirrored in a lot of other um, types of indigenous creative practices. Um, where you're drawing the nature and the flora and fauna around you and representing that in your, in your craft. So this is what she was uh, having her daughters do. So I was, I was truly inspired by the process and the, um, the relationship and connection to, to land that she was uh, representing. So this work is um, called Rug. Uh, it was in Lee Salé, which was uh, in the... Edmonton Art Gallery, the Edmonton. <laughs> I can't remember the gallery name. Alberta? Our Gallery of Alberta. Um, I'll tell you a tiny little bit about the process because it's. Um, I often get asked what river this is, uh, but what I had done is I had taken all of the Métis sites that I could think of that were significant to either me personally or historically, and I overlaid them all on a light table and took out the common aspects of all of those places. And this is the result. So to me, this is a landscape of all those landscapes, but also of an imaginary Métis landscape of, I don't know, of the future of our idyllic or of who knows what. But there's a lot of uh, ways you can think about it. But um, one of the things I will point out is that the the piece itself is always oriented where the river is parallel to the nearest river. And the, there's a tiny little house, beaded house, so you can see. You can maybe see your little red line there. It's always oriented north-south. So it was a type of um, installation and presentation that was mindful of the real world around us. I think that sometimes we can be in a gallery space, we can be in these walls with these fluorescent lights, and forget that there are, is two adjoining rivers running one way or another, right? So um, when we're immersed inside, we, we do kind of forget for a little bit of, of those outside spaces and, and their impact on us. So I wanted to make sure that this piece is forever kind of connected to um, the real I don't know why I keep calling it the real world, because these spaces are real too, but um, the natural world maybe is a better. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about a few types of historical works. The, there are two, um, three works actually at the back of the gallery on either side of the center beaded strawberry piece uh, are these large... Um, I've been calling them wall pockets, but they're also bags in a lot of ways. So um, I've got a few examples of some historical um, Métis uh, wall pockets, as well as a few bags and other portable items to kind of show you where the inspiration comes from. Um, so this is a wall pocket. What wall pockets were, uh, were just these sort of catch-alls in the home. So you would have your wall pocket on the wall, in your kitchen, wherever, at close at hand. You kept all of your recipe cards, your letters, your whatever, your pencils, whatever. Um, but uh, they were always very ornately decorated um, with flowers, with ribbon, with tassel, with whatever anyone had embroidery. They come in so many different shapes and sizes. These are, uh, these are all Cree or Cree Métis makers. There's, this, uh, there's a lot of variation in these, and I think um, part of that has to do with you were working with what you had, um, how much fabric you had. There's even a little quill work one. Um, 
and this one is very, very tiny. So one of the unique features, though, is that um, you could always, it was the quickest thing that you could grab if you had to leave in a hurry. Uh, so when people were being forced out of their homes, displaced for whatever reason, this was something that you could grab off of the wall and, and get out with your most valued um, recipes and, and family connections in it. So um, they're important objects, partly because of that, but also because they, they help, they contain those types of things. They hold those types of things. Um, and that the, the kind of concept of holding is um, holding and carrying is, is, I mean, I think of it as a very um, a loving force, uh, as well as just um, essential force for resistance and for the future of um, where we're going as Indigenous people. So this is a little uh, handbag. Um, again, I don't have my notes on the specifics, so I really apologize about that. Um, but it's, it's decorated to the nines. One of the kind of unique features of things that are portable is that they'll usually have some type of ties or, um, uh, or tassels. I've got an example of mitts. These mitts have string running through them so you don't lose them, that type of thing. So it's something that's common for, for objects that are, that are portable um, so that they're, they're easier to carry. It makes a lot of sense just when you kind of break it down to those uh, brass tacks of it. So this is the result. So you can kind of maybe see how those two types of objects have come together for these pieces. Uh, so I've got one um, piece. It's called Pocket to Hold Resistance and Pockets to Hold Penitence. Um, so that back wall is what I've been calling a devotional space. Um, a devotional to mean uh, a, a space to reflect and to consider. Um, so these pieces are, are in that same way kind of holding these concepts for you to engage with kind of in your own experiences. Those two words to me are, are really interesting words because depending on the intention and the, the voice of the speaker, they, have, they can have very different meanings, right? They can be um, powerful. They can also be um, dangerous. So they're, they're words that can flip on a dime. And I was really interested in in that type of duality. Um, I think that uh, we are, not globally we, are in danger of oversimplifying things and, and attributing singular meanings. And I don't think, I think art's role in, in all of this is to uh, actually bring more complexity. <laughs> so, you know, the, the complexity of the word repent is, is something that kind of just gives me chills uh, to think about. So at the top here uh, is a process of, of rug hooking. I've used yarn. Um, and the flower designs are all iterations off of um, the prairie rose. So um, the same types of roses that Mary was representing in her rugs, that she had her daughters go out to draw. Um, I am taking and, and making my own designs and, and doing my own stylistic spin of it. So on the top is the flower, and um, if you get a chance to take a peek into these pockets, the roots of the flower network are, are safely held in there. And so in the same way that those wall pockets were something that you could grab and run, um, to me, these and your roots and your connections to where you are and, and where you come from, and specifically land connections, are, are, are all that you need in this case. Um, so I want to keep those very safe. Um, and I'll just tell you this little tiny bit here, um, these pom-poms. Um, so I, I now love making pom-poms. I could make pom-poms forever, I think, because they're a lot of fun to do. Um, but I had kind of imagined them as the uh, like water tray that um, roots are pulling up sustenance from. So I'm just trying to point out all of the ways that water kind of comes in in that exhibition downstairs. 
uh, because they, it's multifaceted. Like I had mentioned, that backspace of the gallery uh, is a place for contemplation. And what I was uh, drawing from, I'll kind of bring it back to Mary again, because this work is, is so much about her and, um, and me wanting to understand her and her life a bit better. Uh, uh, that kind of devout Catholicism that she held on to. What I wanted to do was look at it in a way that under, made more sense to me. So I was looking at uh, these architectural spaces of, of churches. Um, some are relevant to, um, that's my cute little family, that's my dad as a teenager on the far end there, um, going to church. Um, this is the uh, original um, St. Boniface Cathedral. And then this is oh, a kind of slightly blurry uh, image of um, the church at Batoche. I just want to see if I have one more. I do, yeah. And this is the altar at, at Batoche. So what I, what I was drawing inspiration from was this very kind of strong try orientation and draw that the architecture intends to lead you down to the end of that altar. So the space has been curated and arranged in a way that um, when you walk into it, you kind of have these two channels that you can walk down, two aisles, you could say. Um, but ultimately, the brightest lights are, are kind of at the end there. And you have, um, if you know the, the space, uh, it has a kind of lower ceiling at that end of the gallery from the escalator. Uh, so it's, it's, it's safer and it's um, more kind of uh, encapsulated. So I wanted to make that into a space that was very different than the, um, the space where the videos are being projected. So that orientation is directly from these types of, of church altars um, that my, my family and, and many families were, were looking to for whatever type of guidance they, um, oh, this is another, favorite of mine. So you can see the, um, all of the church. Uh, this is Mary. That's a Jesus something. It's a cross. More Jesus. Yeah, so I mean, it's these, uh, these idols that people had in their homes and had in their lives. Uh, I've been told by the Sherry Thrill Reset that uh, a lot of times indigenous women were gr naturally gravitating towards Mary as an icon. And of course, the Catholic Church does give a lot of um, strength and importance to uh, Mary as an individual. But further than that, that indigenous women were seeing a lot of parallels in um, the kind of strength of matrilineal, um, a, a strong woman figure, um, and, and, the, and potentially the, the suffering of that, she, that Mary is said to have lived through. So I think there's a lot of um, connections that uh, and not to speak for anybody, even, even my own family, I don't totally know that that's their rationale, but I have heard this from, from Sherry. Um, so this is kind of the, the installation view. Um, so you can see that, um, this kind of looks a bit foreshortened, but um, at the back there, you have your enough space to walk around and, and the, the three, the trifecta <laughs> at the back there. So the last piece I'll talk about is a piece called Mother Berries. Um, so this is the actually only beaded piece in the show. Um, and uh, to me, that Mother Mary figure is, um, yeah, it's, it's something that I can, I can look at and understand. But as my own experience, that is not what I get. Um, I, my mom passed away when I was quite young. And after that, you're kind of left feeling like you don't have a mother anymore. And so I've gone through my life now at this point and have acquired many mothers and many people who have um, helped to nurture and um, develop and care for me in a way that a mother does. And so what I wanted to change in the 
idolization of a single female figure was the um, adoration of the many mother figures that are in my life. So each of these strawberries represents a woman to whom, uh, who has mothered me in some way and, and I hold close and dearly as a mother. Um, so the, uh, the form is, I've heard people as like a family tree. Um, there's of course that this flower is the, the future. Um, there's, uh, it's a never ending process that we kind of bring people, new people into our lives that have significance. Um, and so I wanted to honor the kind of potential of, of whoever will come into my life and, um, and affect me. Um, the form, the form is really interesting. So I don't, I don't know, um, yeah. The, so the work, uh, I had kind of just seen it as portraiture. Um, so if you know that you have those family photographs that are in those kind of oval uh, cardboard frames, that, is, that was my thinking. And then, um, and then I, I had wanted to bring it into to, to an object that was kind of like a piece of furniture. Uh, so this is kind of the process. You'll see how it maybe is never always what you really want it. But um, people have told me and have seen uh, an egg, which of course, the, the color white. Though these colors I use specifically because they're, um, they're the same colors that Mary is represented with. But then also um, as a, like a pregnant belly. Uh, which is, again, just one of those beautiful kind of happy accidents that you or maybe it's like working somewhere back there and that it just kind of happens out. But um, so the work is my version of Mary, um, the many women in my life that have been important to me. So with the last few seconds, I'm going to talk about what I'm going to be doing and what I want to be doing. Um, of all of this, you've seen a ton of family photographs. You've heard me talk about recipes. You've um, uh, family stories specifically. And to me, all of those share one very kind of common and important thing. They're my family's archive. So we've kind of very well established now these specific places where archives are allowed to exist, and that being the museum, um, in galleries, in computers, in data sheets, and to me, the kind of livelihood of um, an alternative archive actually exists in the home and in stories and in all of those documents, photos, um, et cetera, that I've been talking about. So, uh, so this body of work is, um, is, is chronicling uh, another type of story, specifically about my grandmother. Um, and uh, her abusive husband, my grandfather, and, uh, and where she found solace and, and comfort in extremely, extremely hard and trying times. Um, she collected China, grandma is collecting China, um, of the Cliffs of Dover, if anybody knows. Cliffs of Dover is on the um, uh, Britain. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> where is it? <laughs> Uh, on the, yeah, and, on, and the uh, Strait of France. So there's two opposing shores, um, and it holds a lot of significance with war and, and other things, but um, it's a place she never went to. She collected this china her entire life, and um, it started with the first cup that she was given on her wedding day to her husband, my grandfather. So it catapulted her her, I believe, into this, um, this need for escape and, and comfort in something like a, like a kitsch collection. Uh, and those types of collections have as much uh, like value and relevance to understanding and to building and, and knowing about something as, um, as you know, data sheets and as um, museums hold. So I see as an equivalent value, um, very much so, and, uh, and look forward to exploring that a little bit further. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>